know, the Bible says this, that, that there is no other name by which man can be saved than that of Jesus Christ. So every single person in this building today, you carry what they call a truth or you carry something within your life that's so important that needs to come out of you. That needs to come out of you, not just now and then, not just when it is convenient, but it needs to carry out of our lives on a regular, consistent basis. So how do we do that? I'm so glad you asked. We're going to go to John, uh, John 16 today. We're going to go to John 16. How are we going to carry a testimony for Jesus? How are we going to really carry that in our generation, in our time period, right now, how are we going to do that? Well, John 16, uh, uh, sorry, Matthew 16 um, is a pretty important particular part of Scripture. That in Matthew 16, Jesus arrived in the village of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples these particular words. What are people saying about the Son of Man? That's a great question to ask your disciples. So I want to ask you as a church today, City Revival Church in um, Kuala Lumpur, in um, Subang Jaya, right here, I want to ask you a question. When people ask who Jesus is, what's your answer? Come on, because you've got to have an answer to this. When people ask, why are you different? Why are you a Christian? What is your answer? And this was kind of what Peter's answer was. He said, what are people saying about the Son of Man? And, and they replied some things like this. They said, well... You know, some think that you were John the Baptist that have rose from the dead. Some think that you're actually Elisha. You know, some think that you're Jeremiah or even one of the other prophets. Then Jesus again really pinpointed the question to them again. He pressed them. And how about you? Who do you say I am? And you can hear the pause as Jesus paused to listen to those that were so close to him. They ate with him, slept with him, watched their miracles, did everything they had. There was 12 of them and they all sat around him and he paused and he said, but who do you say? Not what the people say, not what Islam says, not what... The government of Malaysia says, not what your church has said. Who do you say the Son of Man is? Then Peter, not really even knowing what he was saying, but you know, having a big, big mouth and being a big voice for all of the rest of the disciples, said, Well, it's fairly obvious, isn't it? I mean, you know, Simon Peter says, you're the Christ, uh, uh, the Messiah, uh, uh, the Son of the living God. Meaning that he was the anointed one, the, the set apart one, the, the, the Son of God that was intended to be on the planet for this particular reason. Peter understood it. He began to start to say it to, to, to Jesus and Jesus was staggered by his response. And he said to him, flesh and blood have not revealed this knowledge or this understanding to you, but my Father who is up in heaven. And then he said these startling words for the church. He said, upon these words, upon this revelation, upon this rock of understanding, I will build my church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. So he was saying directly to Peter, as he's saying directly to us today, the real clux of building the work and the house of God within your life is the ability to see Jesus, not through your interpretation, not through your imagination, not through your intellectual uh, stimulation, but through the revelation and the understanding of God who is in heaven. And so we need a church 
that is so fueled and so fired up of the realization of knowing who Jesus actually is. He's not going to sit among the Buddhas. He's not going to sit among the Muhammads. He's not going to sit among the Hare Krishnas. He has singled himself out as the son of the living God. Not just the son of the living God. He is actually God himself. That's what makes us different. That's what makes our Christianity, that's what makes our religion so alive in a world of religious institutions that are so dead. Come on, that's why they look to the church. That's why they cry out for help from the church because the real fact is, if I am going to be a carrier of a testimony, number one, the first thing is, I'm going to have to understand my destiny and know my mission. You've got to understand what your destiny is and you've got to know what your mission is. Okay, so what's your destiny? Because I want you to start thinking about it right now. Are you completely destined in your life for the rest of the years of your life to live till you're 60, I think you retire here at 65, 66, to retire at 66 and then go out into a coffin at 70 or 80 and pass everything that you've got onto your kids or buy a Ferrari, move to Australia and spend everything you've got. Is that your whole destiny of life? And I tell you, church, we have to shake ourselves out of that type of nonsense and we've got to know that God has called us in this building right now. He has destined our lives to make such a remarkable difference for him, and we've got to start to have our eyes open to it. We've got to have revelation to understand it. We've got to see what God wants to do. John 15, 16. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. So when God chooses us, Just like when we laid hands on Esther this morning and we prayed for Esther this morning prophetically, what came to Esther's life was the most important thing God will do in her life for the rest of the days of her life. So she goes back to her office on Monday morning and sits down and works out the figures of how good my money's going to be, all that type of thing. God, the, The devil, the enemy will allow that to happen. You'll have four little kiddies and, uh, and grandkids for the family, and, 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 but you'll never ever, never ever build a spiritual world that God intended for you to do. So you need to sit back and you need to start to take stock of, has God spoke to me? Is there revelation within my heart? And do I understand my destiny and am I fulfilling the mission of it? See, we're going to talk about this this afternoon in the, in, the, in the seminar. We're going to talk about the church's destiny, what God has spoken to Pastor, what God has said to Pastor about what we're going to do with our church this year. That's fantastic. But, you know, we can't do it unless God first speaks to you and you become collaborative and work toward building the Word of God into your community, into your home, into your nation, into the places where you, where, you, where you reside in the things of God. It's up to you to do it. It's not up to me. It's not up to, you know, to anyone else. You need to accept, expect, accept the responsibility. God chose you. Why did He choose you? See, Peter realized at the moment in time when he said, no, you're not just some prophet, you're, you're God. And we actually standing with God. And you know, Peter for the rest of his life would continually battle with that revelation in his life. Would continually battle with it. He would forsake Jesus, he would run away from the kingdom of God, then he would come back again. Then he would detract and run away again and then he would come back again. And sometimes in the point of our destiny, we're under what they call trials and sometimes we're running away from the very destined plan of God in our lives, yet we may be sitting in church today, but we're running away. And so we need to capture those times in our lives where we're not abandoned, not abandoning the very call of God upon our lives. We need to understand the balance of God's destiny, his work, and our mission. 
of the church. What's your role? What role are you playing in church? Don't tell me. Come on. Don't tell me. You just arrive here Sunday morning, halfway through the worship time, throw your tithe in the offering and go home, and that is your whole, whole commitment to the house of God? Tell that excuse to heaven. Go tell God you're just too busy to serve in the house. Wow! Just go tell the God of heaven that died on the cross for our lives... Gave it all, everything to save us, to give us an eternal life. And the only commitment we got is throw a tithe in the bucket and arrive arrive at church. Halt. Stop. Come on. We're not going to win a world like that. Your Muslims, your the Muslim people in your nation arise at six o'clock in the morning with a big loud speaker and tell the whole nation about him. Oh, well, they're allowed to because it's a Muslim nation. Come on. You think this is a Muslim nation, you're dumber than I think. God ordained this nation. God called Malaysia. God has a plan for this nation. Amazing, amazing plan. So you're going to rise at 6 o'clock in the morning and get some sort of prayer going yourself. Remember the first day I came to Malaysia, I was sitting in front of one of those speakers that was coming through my door I never know, didn't know nothing about the culture here or anything in Australia. If you make noise like that at 6 o'clock in the morning, they kick you out of the country. You're gone, boy. Disturbing the peace, you're finished. And he's going off at the top. And I opened the window and I nearly shared out, would you, would you shut up? I'm trying to get my beauty sleep and you're going off like some lunatic. And I realise it's a different culture. They've allowed that to happen here. You have. Come on, church. You're allowing this to happen. Why don't you change it? Why don't you say in your lives, we're going to change our nation? Not just pray about it. I mean, Pastor prayed a wonderful prayer this morning. But I mean, really, not just pray, but do something about it. Do your neighbours know you're a Christian? Do your business friends know you actually know Jesus in your life? Because let me tell you, if they don't, we're not winning a nation. Oh, we're praying about it, and we're singing, and we're coming to church, and we're doing but we're not really reaching a nation. Because the way we reach them is one by one. One by one. In your homes, your workplaces, the place where you are is your mission field, and you need to shine your testimony to the world around you. The two major projects that God is doing in this world today, the two major projects that God is doing in this world today is building his church and pouring people into it. There's empty seats here today. There's room in this building to have more people. That means your city, there are people outside of these doors here that are not in this church. You want a church of thousands? Well, there are, they're out there, thousands of them. Multiply yourself in someone else and you'll have them. What's here today? 300 maybe? If everyone in this church multiplies themselves, there's 600 in a month. If you multiply yourself again after that, you're in the thousands already. But what we've got to do is we've got to carry a testimony of our lives in our community and in our world if we're going to make a difference. See, God chose people with mission in mind. He chose them. He chose you with a mission in mind. He didn't choose you so that... God, you know, I'm now sick. Oh, God, now I need money. Oh, God, now I need my kids saved. Oh, God, now I need this. Oh, now I'm... And that's all we go to God for every time we need something. And God, what he's doing is he's standing down there saying, I don't want you to go out and reach the nation. Will you talk to your friend at, at, at work about me? Would you, would you tell the government that Jesus is alive? Would you do something about expanding the kingdom? And all we do is go, God, help me. Nah. So we're going to slip into what they call the generation of the dummy Christians, the babies. Every time we need something... We spit the dummy out and we start howling to God. And that's the only time God sees us. I believe and I know it that when we're serving God and we're making a difference 
and we're inviting people to come to know God and we're beginning to change our world, my prayers get answered. <laughs> it's not a, you know, it's not astounding revelation. I'm just telling you the truth. When we're living for God, when we're spreading his word, your prayers already kind of are already getting answered at the same time. And it, this, this, it's an incredible truth to understand this, that we as a church need to understand this. What can I be equipped to do? That's my second question for you. What can I be equipped to do? So glad you asked again. You're so wonderful. This is one of the great needs of church life. When I travel all around the world, I'm prophesying over people, and most of the time, I prophesy over people who have got no idea what they're doing in church life. None. They've either got upset so they're not serving any longer. They've either got some anger about something so they're just offended and not involved with anything all the time. They're either their work scene or their family circumstances are not in the right place so that draws all their attention away and so they're not really making a difference whatsoever in their own Christian life because they're just cluttered with all this nonsense and that's the enemy the devil who wants to stop the church from actually reaching its mandate reaching the call of God upon their life because the church becomes self-indulgent I'm here for me that's great I think that coming to church is a good thing for my business. I think coming to church is a good thing for my family. I think coming to church is a good thing for this. If you think that's what church is good for, then we've missed the whole reason around it. God didn't bring you into this church for you to sit in a chair, listen to pastor every week. He brought you into this church to equip your life, your special gifts, your special role within whatever you're called to do, and then release you into the harvest field to make a difference for God. Isn't that true? 